Greetings and salutations, beautiful people. Welcome back to Pokemon Biology, and today we're going to be telling the sad tale of a Pokemon that serves as a stark warning to not only the citizens of the Pokemon world, but is also a direct message to the people of our world, who need to take immediate action to stave off an ecological catastrophe. Let's dive in. As Pokemon fans, we've been a bit spoiled with the sheer number of games that have come out over the recent years, and with these games come a variety of new mechanics for us to play around with. While some of these systems have been more praised by the fans than others, there is one recent addition that I believe has gotten mostly positive reviews from the community, and that was the introduction of regional variants. In case you forget, starting with Generation 7, along with the new roster of Pokemon to capture and battle with, Game Freak also dove deep into the Pokemon Vault and gave us revamped designs to some classic Mons. As a Pokemon fan, I always like to see some forgotten friends get some much needed love. But as a biologist, I love how Game Freak is taking the time to redesign these new Pokemon forms, not only to be more interesting or perhaps spice up their battle mechanics, but they also revamp their design so that they better fit in with the new regional environment that they're being found in. For example, take Galarian Weezing, whose Sword and Shield Pokedex entry says, Long ago, during a time when droves of factories fouled the air with pollution, Weezing changed into this form for some reason. My sciency brain is already starting to team with ideas about what some reason might have been. But if I think about it too much, then I'm going to get off track. So let's save Weezing for perhaps another time. But regardless of the biological theory crafting we could do, Game Freak with these new regional forms is actually demonstrating to us a classic example of evolution. No, no, not that evolution, like real evolution in action. But this brings us to the focus of today's episode. One of these regional variants that I feel like has gotten a bit lost in the shuffle. Maybe because its original Pokemon was pretty weak, or maybe the new design was not that visually interesting or goofy, but the design of this Pokemon is a grim reminder of what the future of the Pokemon world and our world is going to look like if we do not take action quickly. Today, we're looking at the sad tale of Galarian Corsola. The original Corsola came out all the way back in Generation 2, and it's pretty clear by the name and its design that it's meant to be a representation of Coral. But how does this cheery, happy, water rock Pokemon grow up to become the pale, white, depressed, obviously dead, creature we see in Pokemon Sword and Shield? To figure out what happened to our Coral Pokemon, we need to first establish what Coral is in the first place. Despite what Game Freak seems to imply by the typing, Coral are not rocks, and they're not plants either. Coral are actually animals that belong to the group of invertebrates called Cnidaria, along with the jellyfish and sea anemone. Coral end up bunching into large colonies of coral reefs that serve as the home for dozens of species. Don't feel bad if you originally thought that coral was a plant. To be fair, with the exception of coral, anemone, and sponges, just about every other animal you can find on Earth is mobile and there's actually a good reason for that. You see, plants have the unique ability to absorb sunlight and carbon dioxide and turn it into a usable food source called glucose, a type of sugar, in a process called photosynthesis. Glucose is used by organisms like plants and animals to carry out their basic functions. Having this virtually unlimited glucose supply means that plants don't need to move. They can just affix themselves to the ground and then get their energy straight from the sun. Animals, on the other hand, lack the ability to go through photosynthesis, and thus must eat plants or other animals to get their glucose fix. Animals, therefore, have evolved the ability to move. This gave them a powerful advantage in the world. They can use their movement to find new food sources or to escape from predators, at the cost of needing even more glucose to power that movement. But if sedentary organisms like coral can't move, and they can't perform photosynthesis, how can they acquire enough glucose to survive? The answer to that question is a secret weapon found just underneath their colorful exterior. Algae. You see, algae are microscopic organisms that, like plants, also go through photosynthesis to produce glucose. These little photosynthetic friends, delightfully called zooxanthellae, form a symbiotic relationship with the coral. A symbiotic relationship is where two species live and associate with each other, and they both help each other out. The algae actually make residence inside the tissues of the coral and give the coral their unique, colorful patterns. So how does this relationship end up benefiting them? For the coral, they get access to all of the excess glucose the algae makes without having to waste energy moving around. The algae, for its generosity, get a nice safe home living inside the tissues of the coral and away from their predators. A perfect relationship. BFFs! Nothing is ever going to tear these two creatures apart. Or is it? 
Meanwhile, we turn our attention to those factories of Galar mentioned in Weezing's Pokedex entry. To power all of those machines that make, well, everything, they need a lot of energy. They get that energy by burning what are called fossil fuels, like coal, oil, or natural gas. These handy fuel sources can generate a lot of energy for the making of machines, clothes, or any other mass-produced product. However, the burning of these fossil fuels produces something else besides energy carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, is a gas that, as we talked about earlier, is normally pretty useful for the ecosystem. Plants and algae use CO2 to make the glucose they need to survive during photosynthesis. So why is producing CO2 in factories such a problem? Well, that's because those factories, and indeed the factories and power plants that power our lives in the real world, are producing too much CO2 that even all the plants and the algae in the world can't use. This CO2 instead begins to build up in large quantities in the atmosphere and cause all sorts of problems for coral, corsola, and the whole planet. CO2 is what is known as a greenhouse gas. This means it likes to absorb the heat energy from the sun. So as time goes on, and as more and more CO2 builds in the atmosphere, it begins to have a warming effect, increasing the temperature of the air. As the temperature of the air rises, so does the temperature of the water. As time goes on, if even more CO2 gets put into the air, even the atmosphere can't hold it all, and it begins to slowly dissolve into the ocean. Once the CO2 enters the seas, it begins to react with water molecules to form something called carbonic acid. Carbonic acid, as you can imagine, is an acid which, if you know anything about acids, you know that they don't tend to mix well with living creatures. So to recap, the excess CO2 produced in the factories by fossil fuels is leading to the increase in both the temperature and acidities of the ocean. This sends up all sorts of panic signals to the coral, which ultimately leads to the breakup of our happy marriage. It all starts with the algae. They're the first to detect the rising temperatures and acidity. As a defense mechanism, they begin to produce certain other compounds in an effort to protect themselves. However, while these chemicals protect the algae, they're quite dangerous for the coral. Coral has a tough choice to make. If the coral stays with the algae, then it surely will die as a result of the chemicals the algae are producing. If the coral chooses to lose its best friend, then it also loses its only reliable access to glucose, and thus, will lead to its eventual starvation. The coral makes the only choice it can that has a chance of saving itself and its symbiotic partner. The coral expels the algae from its tissues. Along with kicking out its only food producer, it also loses its colorful appearance, and it turns a pale, white, almost transparent color. This is known as coral bleaching. The coral attempts to survive for as long as it can with whatever glucose it has left. If the temperature and acidity return to normal soon, then the algae can return once again, and the crisis will have been averted. But this isn't a fairy tale. There isn't a happy ending. You see, the temperatures never go down, and the buildup of carbonic acid never stops, because those factories continue to produce more and more CO2. So what happens to Corsola? As it sits there on the bottom of the ocean, motionless, desperately holding on for dear life, it uses the last of its glucose and starves to death. With the death of Corsola and other corals, all of the organisms that rely on coral for their survival begin to suffer. Coral reefs are extremely important to the health of tropical aquatic ecosystems. As coral reefs in the Pokemon and real world begin to die, it's like we're watching the slow death of the rainforest of the sea. Game Freak is warning us. They're telling us that if we do not find new, greener ways of generating energy, besides fossil fuels that produce CO2, then coral and many other Pokemon, and indeed real life creatures, might become fossils of their own. Big thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. All of the vocab from today's episode can be found in the description. Do you know someone who loves Pokemon or science? Share this story with them so we can keep the channel growing. If you found this video interesting, why don't you check out some other videos on the channel and subscribe so you don't miss a new video posted every month. This has been Pokemon Biology, and as always, we gotta learn them all.